Hello and welcome to this Open Security Summit session uh, in May 2022. We have got Akira Brand here about to do a great session on hacking your own app. Over to you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the lovely intro. Hi, everyone. My name is Akira. Um, I am a developer relations engineer at Bright Security. I just want to welcome everybody to the workshop today. Also, I know we may have some people watching this later on the recording. So if you are going to watch this on the recording, a very warm welcome to you. Um, and the name of this workshop today is Hack Your Own App. Today I'm going to fix, excuse me, I'm going to teach you all about how to use a dynamic application security testing tool to scan and fix vulnerabilities in your own applications as well as share some great insights into more secure coding. So here's what we're gonna to cover today. So at the end of the day, what I really wanna leave you with is that DAS scanners are your friend. Um, you can indeed write secure code and we're gonna teach you how. So the first thing we're gonna go over is just basic application security, what it is, why it matters, and how you can start writing secure code. We're also gonna cover why Bright? So why are we deciding to use the Bright DAS and not a different one? We'll then have a workshop. After the workshop, we're going to talk a little bit about preventative measures on how to start writing more secure code from the beginning of your process and uh, hopefully leave you with some good tips on preventative measures. I'm also gonna be monitoring the chat um, I think it's actually on the other, yep, it's on the wrong screen. So let me go ahead and grab that. I'll monitor the chat for questions. If you want to unmute, since there's not many of us today, feel free to do that and ask questions on voice. Or if you're more comfortable with just asking questions in the chat, that's totally fine. All right, so let's talk a little bit about me and I can convince you that I am qualified to teach this topic. Uh, my name is Akira, as I said. I am a software developer and educator. I have worked in software development for over three, about three and a half years now, mainly in e-commerce and ed tech. Uh, first, I was a webmaster dash software developer for a very small mom and pop shop called PS Products, who had distributed networks all over the West Coast for selling um, all kinds of all kinds of products. And I was the person in charge of all of their website maintenance, I created new sites for them. I even learned a little bit of UX and UI during that time, which was a lot of fun. Uh, after that, I worked with a company called Emeritus. Uh, Emeritus is an educational technology company that collaborates with Ivy League colleges to bring education that is at an Ivy League level to anyone that wants to take that kind of education. So I collaborated with Emeritus and MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to write a coding bootcamp that was focused on the MERN stack. And what that means is that it's Mongo, uh, Express, React, and Node. So full stack JavaScript. It was a lot of fun. I loved working there. Um, and I also worked there as a TA for the same course for quite some time. So I got a cool view of both sides of the coin, creating the course and also teaching the course. That being said, I've been a teacher for over 10 years. I uh, taught initially in my first career as an opera singer. I taught quite a lot of voice lessons. I taught group classes anywhere from age five to 83. So if you're in that age, ra age range at this course, you are in good hands. <laughs> we will figure out how to convey the information to you, no matter how old you are. Um, the last thing I'll mention is that I was a NASA Hackathon Award recipient back in 2018. Um, that's one of the, I think, coolest accomplishments of my professional career. We won an award for essentially uh, ideal or IDI, I, what's the word I'm looking for? Essentially, we had a really good idea for using machine learning and um, also for using, oh, sorry about that. My screen just went a little wonky. Also for using, um, NASA satellite data to track um, agricultural uh, trends in settlement camps for refugees to see what kind of mutual aid would need to be provided. So that's a little bit about me. 
So here's what you're gonna need to participate today. You will need a laptop with uh, admin privileges and the ability to install software. You're gonna need a modern web browser like Firefox or Google Chrome. You will need to be connected to Wi-Fi. If you are watching this and you are not connected to Wi-Fi, I want to know how, because that's pretty incredible. If you don't want to install anything on your machine today, if you don't wanna do the walkthrough with us or do the workshop, that's also fine. You can just watch, you will get a lot out of this. Okay, so first things first, our goal today is to teach you how to automate application security. So this really behooves you as a software developer. The main reason is that the earlier you can find secure uh, security bugs, the better. Um, the also cheaper it is to find security bugs earlier. And if you are having a security mindset from the very beginning, you will become a better developer. One thing I wanna to mention too, is that how to write secure code and how to test that your code is secure is not common knowledge. When I was working uh, with Emeritus and MIT to build the Mernstack Bootcamp, we actually had a whole section on cybersecurity. However, um, that is not the norm. The norm in all educational institutions that I have seen is to gloss over security altogether. So unfortunately what happens is developers get into the workforce and they don't understand how to write secure code. They don't understand why it's important. And as a result, we're often shipping a lot of code with a lot of security bugs and we don't really understand why. So on that note, why bother writing secure code? Well, let me put it this way. As a software developer, you are a prime target for malicious actors. Um, because you have so much control over the product itself, over the build, over the decisions, over the architectural patterns, hackers are going to do their best to exploit the vulnerabilities that you write into the code at the very beginning. There's a lot of consequences to this. So for example, what if you're writing a code for a heart monitor and a malicious actor gets into that heart monitor and is able to turn it off for a specific period of time? What if a, a malicious actor is somehow able to get behind a firewall and they can attack your network they can go into your database, they can change the database, they can delete the database, they can copy it over and get a lot of information that they shouldn't be getting. And again, what I wanna leave you with is that you are a prime target. And again, we don't talk about this in our educational institutions for training software developers. So software developers don't realize that they are ground zero for security issues. One other thing that I want to mention about writing secure code and why it's worth it is that if you write secure code from the get-go, your security team is gonna like you a lot more um, and you're gonna like them a lot more because you're gonna be paired, right? You're gonna be on the same team. And oftentimes what happens in large organizations especially is the security team is over here and the dev team is over here and ne'er the twain shall meet. So one thing I wanna leave you with in this slide in particular it is something called the CIA triangle. This stands for confidentiality, availability, and integrity. This is the raison d'etre. It is the reason of being for all cybersecurity teams in your organization. The more that you start to think about your own code this way, is my code available at all times? Is the software I'm writing available? Is the data behind the software confidential? And does the software have integrity, meaning it can't be broken, the earlier you start thinking about this, the better, and the more your security team will start to become able to speak to you in a way that is like where you guys can understand each other. So what are we going to do about it as software developers? Of course, I can't teach you every single tenant of writing secure code in one day. That would be impossible. It is a lifelong journey. Um, hopefully, though, that this leads you with some kind of way to get started. So what I'm going to do today is introduce a dynamic application security testing tool from Byte Security that will be the solution to this problem. 
So we have, again, like we said, we had all these problems. Software developers aren't writing secure code. They don't know how to write secure code. It's never really taught to them. It's very piecemeal. They don't know the tools out there. And if they do, maybe only half the team uses it. And on the other hand, you have the security team who's just panicking all the time because they're getting buggy software, but it's too late in the process to do much of anything. So we're shipping insecure code. So what I'm hoping again, is that you will take away some lessons from this training on how to use this tool and be able to find security vulnerabilities in your own apps. Um, and without having to do it without needing to rely on a manual pen tester way too late in the software development life cycle. This also, like I said, will make you a better developer. The more secure code you write, the better your code inherently is. This will also improve your security literacy through using this tool. The good news though, is that you don't need to know a lot about security to start out just using this tool. So hopefully, like I said, you'll, deci you'll decide you wanna test your own code with what you learned today before you send it to QA, before anyone else sees it and you can start fixing those bugs for yourself. Um, you can also integrate this into a CICD pipeline. That is the best use case in my opinion is you just start integrating this. And so every time you commit, you can have some kind of security tool, scanning your code, making sure everything is kosher. So why Bright? Why, why are we using Bright? Um, well, first off, what I will say is that I work here. So that is a big reason that we're gonna use it today. Uh, but beyond that, it's a, it's a solid tool. There is a free tier that you can use. Uh, it's up to five scan hours a month, which is actually quite a lot. We're gonna go through some of the unique features of the tool today um, and be able to sort of illustrate how we're unique uh, in the market. Um, but in the meantime, let's talk about some other tools that you might already be using. So tool number one is software composition analysis. This is SCA for short. What does this mean? Well, software composition analysis looks at what dependencies you're using in your code and if they're legit. So that being said, are they secure? Can you use them um, and be able to sleep at night? So I had a little kind of joke. I don't know if it's gonna work, but okay. So yeah, here we go. So this little dot in the middle of this huge circle is your code. This is what often happens with software is the actual code that you have written is very, very small in comparison to the rest of the code that has been written. Um, so again, SDA goes through and looks at all of the dependencies, all of the code in total to make sure that there are no major security vulnerabilities. Another tool that many people use is called a SAST. This is called Static Application Security Testing. What a SAS does is it looks at your static code. So it's sort of like a security linter. Um, it's a testing methodology that analyzes source code and it finds security vulnerabilities that make your application susceptible to attack. What's different about SAS versus DAS, which is what we do at Bright, is a SAS will scan an application before the code is compiled. It's literally just looking at static code. Um, another way to say it is called white box testing. So that brings me to dynamic application security testing, which again is what we do here at Bright. What that does is it runs, excuse me, it interacts with your application or your API as it's running. So it would be very similar to how a user would interact with your application or how a malicious actor or a hacker would initially interact with your application. So this finds all of the holes in your application where there could be security issues as it's running. A lot of SaaS tools will not catch everything that a DAST will. And the downside to a lot of SaaS tools is that it has a lot of what are called false positives, which essentially means it is telling you that, that something is a security issue when it's actually not. The downside to false positives is that it wastes a lot of time. You're going around and you're hunting ghosts when in fact, what you should be doing is fixing the actual vulnerabilities that are actually there. I'm gonna take a second and go to the chat and see if there are any questions. Are there any VMs to test the code? Also, as the code becomes larger and complex, 
secure coding is not a priority for most of the developers. How to address this? Um, Prakash, that's a really good two-part question, so let me take it in two parts. So VMs to touch, test the code. Um, you can run a VM and run your application in that VM and run a DAST also inside of that. As far as VMs to test the actual code, let me say it this way. I know that I have heard rumors of such a thing existing, but I could not myself tell you what they are. But at the end of the um, presentation today, you have a chance to take down my email or my Twitter. So feel free to take that down and we can have a conversation about that uh, offline. So as code becomes larger and complex, let's talk about this second question. Secure coding is not a priority for most of the developers, how to address this. In my personal opinion, which is why we're here today, the way to address this is to give developers dev-friendly tools early on in their process of writing code that can help them write more secure code, such as a DAS scanner or such as a SAS. Um, this will help them to not have to know everything that there is to know about cybersecurity in order to write secure code. It will literally just interact with their application. It'll take a look at their code itself and help them to understand the pain points that are most problematic without having to become cybersecurity experts, right? Because we don't need devs to be experts. That's what the security team is for. But we do need devs to be equipped with tools where they can know if they're making gross errors, really, really big mistakes in shipping code that isn't secure. Tiago said, nowadays it is always worthy to mention the IAC security scanners as everyone keeps moving more into the cloud. Tiago, that's a really good point. Um, having cloud security scanners is also becoming more and more of a trend. Prakash wants to know what are the false positive rates? I can't speak for other products with our product, the false positive rate is zero, which is fantastic. You will not get false positives with our product. Um, as far as, again, as far as rates for other products, I can't speak to that, but I know that there, there are quite a lot. Okay, let's see here. So let's talk a little bit more about Bright in depth. Uh, so the first thing I wanna go over is that we have a lot of capabilities. We're not just a DAS tool that scans for a couple things, like the OWASP top 10. We are quite, uh, we're quite broad in our ability to have good coverage and good analysis. That says we can scan web apps, we can scan internal APIs, we can scan regular APIs such as SOAP or REST or even GraphQL. In the world of microservices, we can also do that. We can scan microservices. We have a way to uh, program authentication into your scans so that we can scan not only the unauthenticated section of an app, but also the authenticated part of the app. Um, like I said, it's easy to use and all good cybersecurity tools for developers should be easy to use and they should make sure that the developers themselves do not have to be cybersecurity experts. Um, something else that we did in our design, we actually built the platform to be able to be con uh, directly configured from a CLI you can also do it from a UI, which is how we're going to do it today. Um, we have no false positives, as I said, and we also have integrations. We can do UI for security. The devs stay in the dev environment. So as far as integrations go, uh, we can do CircleCI, we can do Jenkins, Jira, GitLab, GitHub, um, and many, many more. Um, speed, this is quite fast. You can also configure the scans to make them even faster. If you do a very hardcore brute force, entire attack surface covered scan, um, we have a website that we intentionally built to be vulnerable to scan that entire website. For me, it takes about an hour, but you can also configure scans to be done in a matter of minutes. It just depends how you configure it. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, payloads, um, lots and lots of ability to see different kinds of issues, um, for example, SQLite, cross-site scripting, CSERF. We are currently working on business logic tests. So you can actually test the business logic in your application to see if that is going to be an issue as far as security goes. So uh, for me, I think that is a pretty good, pretty solid um, reason to use Bright. And then of course, last but not least, there is a free tier, so I like that as well. We have a couple of questions in the chat. 
Do you have any sample scan report available? Yes, Prakash, I do. And we're going to go over that in the workshop. Absolutely. All right, last thing I want to say, I just want to introduce the concept today of integrating a DAS scanner into your CI CD pipeline. So the best way to use a DAS, and honestly, the best way to use any cybersecurity testing tool is to integrate it into your CI CD. Because then it's automated, you don't have to think about it. It runs every single time there's a commit, it's very useful. We're not gonna go over today how to integrate this into a CI CD pipeline. Um, the reason being is that that's a whole different topic for a whole different talk. Uh, if you are interested in that though, we have a YouTube channel where you can go and see um, different examples of integrating into CI CD pipeline. There's also an entire workshop on our YouTube channel. Okay, that being said, it is time for our workshop. Um, so let's get started. Let's get our hands dirty. Let's learn a little bit more about this DAST and let's scan a web app. So here's what the process looks like. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up an account. We're gonna start what's called a repeater. I'll explain that in a second. We're gonna create a scan. We're gonna run the scan on an intentionally vulnerable website called brokencrystals.com. While the scan runs, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how to scan APIs and how to use HAR files. Um, and then we're going to discuss the results of the scan. Any questions on that before we jump into the workshop section? Let me just make sure that everyone is on the same page. Okay, sounds like we don't have any questions right now. Ah, fantastic. Okay, so here we go. I am going to go over here. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to brightsec.com. I'll also put that in the chat. B-R-I-G-H-T-S-E-C.com. That is our official uh, website that we're gonna use today. You're going to go here and click sign up. Perfect. Oops, let me go ahead and log out. All right, so you can sign up a couple ways. You can sign up with GitHub, sign up with Google, or you can use your email. So whichever one you want to do, go ahead and do that. I am going to use my email personally, and we're going to do a little bit of a cool Google trick that I actually realized um, is that if you are using a Gmail account and you have already signed into something or already created an account on something and you need to somehow create an account again, you can add a plus two, which is super cool, or a plus three, or a plus four, or a plus whatever number. And uh, Google will actually not, like it'll realize it as a separate account, but it will still go to your original inbox, which I just think is really cool. So that's a fun little tidbit. Let's make a password. All right, and let's do, oh, whoops, I accidentally was doing a sign in. So let me go sign up with your email here, okay. What is my whole name? My whole name is Akira Brand. Prakash says, I am aware of this trick. It is wonderful. Yes, I learned this trick a couple days ago and I'm pretty sure it has changed my life. All right, shift. Akira Brand, oh, that has a, that is not an app symbol. Here we go. Repeat the password, make sure your password is nice and secure. It'd be very ironic if you, use the password of password to do this workshop because that it's a cybersecurity workshop. All right, sorry, I cracked myself up. All right, let's go to create a free account. All right, you're gonna confirm your email address. I'm gonna do that over here on a screen you can't see. You'll just have to take my word for it that it is in fact happening. Okay, let's see. might be in your spam. Okay. Let's see here. Looks like there's a little bit of a goofy thing going on. Let me try a different way of doing it on my end. Another way you can do this if that trick actually doesn't work. Looks like for some reason it's not working on my end right now. You can put a dot in the middle anywhere on your email address. So let's try that. I feel like I just told you this great trick and then it didn't work for me. So sorry about that. 
but we will just keep on trucking here. All right, let's try this again. Okay. All right. Okay, go to spam. Oh, very interesting. Okay, for some reason it's not working on mine, which is quite strange. If it is working for you though, if you have um, gone ahead and confirmed your email address, can you please put in the chat that you have done that? Just let me know if it is working for you guys. And then, anyone in the chat, have you signed up? Is it working for you? Okay. All right. All right, let's try one more time. I think I know what's going on. All right, A, turn up brand, plus one. All right, let's try my bright back email. Whoops, that's embarrassing. Sorry guys, this will just take a second. Technical difficulties. Funny because you think that live coding is like the hardest part of running a workshop and sometimes Signing up for email addresses is the hardest part of running the workshop. All right, let's try that. Last time, three times a charm. Ha ha, here it is. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this is a little embarrassing, but I'm a very honest person, so I'm going to tell you what I did. I accidentally put in a cure brand at Gmail. That email doesn't exist. I should have put a cure brand at Brightset. Now we know. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and verify email. Tiago says, I'm not testing that. Maybe Bright has protections against that trick. Yeah, that's probably pretty smart. All right, so now let's go to sign in. Here we go. All right, so let me put in my email correctly this time. Super smart. Brightstack.com, put in my password. And we're going to sign in. All right. So the first thing you need to do is you need to create a new organization. I'm going to create an organization name called Open Security Summit Awesomeness. Because clearly we're awesome. Okay, let's create that. Now what you'll see is a setup wizard. Um, I highly recommend going through the setup wizard. If you don't, if you get a little wonky trying to set everything up for yourself. So here's what the setup wizard is gonna do. It's gonna install the Neuralegion CLI on your machine. And it's also going to set up what is called a repeater. So let's talk about the repeater for a second. The first thing a repeater does is it makes sure that when you are scanning a target, so if you're scanning an API or you're scanning a web application, that the scan is actually coming from the IP address of your machine. It's not coming from us at Bright. So why does that matter? Well, here's the thing. We are all obviously lawful good in this room. Um, so we would never dream of using this dash scanner for evil. However, there are bad actors in the world. I hate to break it to you, but there are. And they can actually use a DAS to scan any web app on the web. So that is illegal. Um, and so what essentially the repeater does is says, okay, if you decide to use this tool for evil, and us personally do have safeguards against it, but other DAS maybe don't. So if you decide to use this tool for evil, you are the one to blame. We are going to put your IP address as the person who tried to hack other people's stuff and you cannot use ours. So that's what a repeater does. It installs locally on your machine and it essentially makes the IP address of the scan come from your machine, not from us. Um, so let's click next. All right, there are three ways to install the Neuralegion CLI. You can use Docker, you can use NPM, or last but not least, you can use Windows Installer. I personally am a uh, big fan of NPM. 
uh, but you can use Docker or you can use Windows installer. What I will say um, is that there is a small bug right now um, that has to do with the uh, Windows installer, the actual, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? The actual command links to a different version of what of the installer than we actually need. So I'm gonna put in, if you're gonna use Windows installer, what you should actually use in the chat. So if you are on a PC or you're on a Windows machine and you wanna use the Windows installer, um, we are working on fixing it, but it's, just, it's software, everything has bugs. Don't use this use the link that I just put in the chat. Okay, so let's go back here, NPM. So I have already um, gone ahead and installed the uh, CLI on my, on my personal machine, so I don't need to redo that again, but I am gonna check and make sure that the version is correct because who knows, things happen, right? So let me bring over my terminal to this screen. Make this a little bit smaller so you can see my terminal. Come on. Come on. Where'd that little terminal go? Where's that silly little terminal? Here we go. All right, so let's just check and make sure that my version is in fact correct. Great, 8.7.1, so we're good. All right, let me stop really quick and see if there's any questions in the chat. If anyone is having issues, please do let me know. If you are all set up, also please let me know. Just say I'm good or I'm set up or something along those lines. Let me just take a look at the chat. Let's see. Nothing in the chat so far. So I'm going to assume that we are all good. Um, again, if you have questions or something isn't quite working, Gosh, it's good. Awesome. Thank you for letting me know. Um, if you have questions or something isn't working, please do say that in the chat. Okay, so everybody click next if you haven't already done that. Um, because again, I already have the CLI installed and it could tell that I didn't, it didn't actually copy that command. It'll make sure, did you actually install this thing? Yes, I did. Um, if you are getting this though and you have not yet installed the CLI, this is a good time to make sure that you actually have installed the CLI. Let's push continue. Okay, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start the repeater. So this again, we'll start it on your local machine. Um, as you can see here, the, the command has uh, an exploit CLI, so that's the CLI that we just installed, the name of the tool, repeater. Then you're gonna have an ID here, this is the repeater ID. Token, this is an automatically generated API token for you. And then cluster, which is where it's coming from. So, Let's see here, let's go back to my little tiny terminal. I'm actually gonna make this a little bigger so y'all can see it a little bit better. And let's start that repeater. Okay, give it a second to start. Okay, the repeater started. Now let's go back to our setup wizard. We're gonna refresh the status here to make sure that it actually did connect. Looks good, it says all connected, so we are done. All right, welcome to the UI of uh, Bright Security. One thing I do wanna mention, just to call out, you'll notice that we are branded here as Neuralegion. This is Bright. We just had a name change about a month ago and we're still working on getting um, a few things updated. So don't panic if you see Neuralegion and I've been saying Bright Security the whole time. This is, uh, this is the right tool, you're in the right place. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna push create scan. There you go. Couple things I wanna call out here. There are a few ways to scan what's called the attack surface. So the attack surface is essentially anything on your web app or on your API that can be exploited. So we can do something called automatic crawling, which just goes over your entire website or your API and interacts with the entire thing the same way that a user or a malicious actor would you can also do something called a HAR file. Um, a HAR file is great if you don't want to do a full scan of your entire website. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later, um, but essentially again, what a HAR file does is it sort of pairs down the uh, section of your website that you are scanning. Uh, the last thing you can do is you can use an API schema 
or API endpoints. Um, schema, you can get that like from a Swagger file, you can use Postman, anything of that nature, you can actually upload um, or direct link to it if you have a direct link. And our tool will go ahead and scan that for you. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna do via automatic crawling. So we're gonna do an entire scan of an entire website. We're gonna choose a repeater. This one, we're gonna just do the default repeater, the one we just started. Now, something I wanna call out here, the repeater has to remain actively connected. What does that mean? It means don't close your computer, don't throw your computer out the window because you're frustrated, don't unplug your computer and let the battery die. Because the repeater is installed on your local machine and you're using the repeater, it has to be up and running. Your machine has to be up and running the entire time. So if you're gonna run a heavy duty scan, for example, the way we're doing it now with automatic crawling on a very, very large website, especially you have, if you have authentication objects configured, so you're running an authenticated scan and a non-authenticated scan, make sure your computer is up, running, plugged into power, if your computer loses power or the computer turns off, the scan will stop. And that'll be a huge bummer and a waste of time. So let's put in the crawler target. What does this mean? This is just the website that we're gonna scan. In this case, we're gonna do HTTP colon slash slash broken, type, broken crisp, oh, I can't type it all, broken crystals.com. What is this website? Why am I picking this random website? Well, this website is actually uh, made by Bright Security um, to be an intentionally vulnerable web app. The web app is garbage. Do not write your code the way we wrote it for Broken Crystals because it will be super, super vulnerable. So I'll actually show you what the website itself looks like. I get a huge kick out of it. Um, maybe you recognize that face. That is Walter White. But you can go here. Um, and use Broken Crystals to test this DAST. You can also scan it um, with other DAS if you want. We built this so that you can actually up your hacking skills. So feel free to use it for other projects as well. Okay, so we have our target scan details. We need to add a project. We're just gonna do the default project right now. Right now, we're not gonna do an authenticated scan. What you can do is if you need to create um, some kind of way to authenticate a user, to the website so that you can scan not only the unauthenticated, but also the authenticated portion of your website. This would be where we would do that. We're not gonna do that today. Again, it's kind of another topic for another talk. All right, and then let's push start scan. Okay, so that is pending. While this scan runs, I wanna go over a couple things. First off, I wanna teach you about how to use this tool by a HAR file. And I also wanna teach you how to use this tool to scan an API schema. So you can also do API security testing. The first thing we're gonna do, let's talk about a HAR file um, and how to use HAR files in a scan so that you do not have to scan an entire website for the entire time and it will be much, much faster. But before I go into that, are there any questions are there any concerns, any comments? Um, let me just wait for a moment and see if anyone wants to share anything in the chat. Um, also, I have a question for you. If you don't have any questions, well, I'm gonna ask you a question, which is, have you ever used a tool like this either in your day job or on side projects? And if you have used it, I'm curious what your experience was like. And if you haven't used it, that's also fine. You can just type in, I've never used this. This is my first experience. And you're doing so great, Akira. <laughs> just kidding, you don't have to say that, but you could if you wanted to. All right, let's see here. Okay, it looks like there's no questions, no comments or concerns. Anyone use this kind of tool yet in their, in their job? Let's see if anyone replies to that. No worries if not. Okay, let's go on then. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, again, how to use a HAR file. So what's a HAR file? Essentially a HAR file is a file that records any kind of request and response that goes on while a user interacts with your web application. So the way that you can see that is let's go back to brokencrystals.com and you can push inspect right here and take a look at your network tab. 
Um, in this case, make sure that these two checkboxes are checked. One is preserve log. The other one is disable cache. And now let's just go ahead and interact with our website like a user would. So say, for example, you just want to test the sign-in mechanism. Is this secure? This tiny section of my website that I just wrote, I don't want to test the whole thing. So I'm going to go to sign it. And as you can see, there is a lot of request responses here. So say, for example, you want to test one of them. This, let's just choose this one right here. What you would do is you would select it. And you would do save all as har with content right here. We're going to go ahead and save it here in my download. Let's call it brokencrypt1.com. All right. Then what you would do here in the create scan, you would do via recorded session dot har file. You would choose your repeater. And you would then be able to choose a file from your disk. So let's go ahead and select the one that we just used. And it will just test that section, which is fantastic. It saves you a lot of time. So we go ahead and upload that. We're just going to do the Broken Crystals host. We're not going to worry about the font for Google APIs or anything like that. Um, and you, But you can also, of course, you can select which hosts you want to test, which is pretty cool. And you'll add it to a project, and then you'll start that scan. Um, oh, because I'm on the free version, I have reached maximum parallel scans. If you are on a paid version, you can run more than one scan at once. But for now, let me go ahead and add this to the queue. I'm not sure that everything will be done running by the time we're done here, but I do want to illustrate to you that the HAR file scan runs quite quickly, much, much faster than um, a scan that is just done by automatic crawling. So again, if you're integrating this into your CI CD pipeline, you can choose to run it by a HAR file. Um, and unfortunately, even though you do need to upload the HAR file each and every time, it's much faster, which is great. OK, something else I want to show you now is how to do a scan by an API schema. So we're going to go to uh, Create Scan. We're going to do via API schema or other API endpoints. Again, choose your repeater. It has to come from you. Then let's go here, API settings. Let me see if I can scroll down. OK, so you can do a Swagger file from your disk, a pre-uploaded file, or a link to file. What we're going to do, is we're going to go to brokencrystals.com. We actually have a section where you can see this. Right here on our API schema, we have an open, an open API in JSON format. What you can do is you can actually copy that link and put it right here and link to file. You'll need to import it. You're going to select a brokencrystals.com host, and then you can scan your API, which is super cool. One other thing that you can do here that we have is opening it in a schema editor. And for example, you can show parts of your API in schema view, and you can actually take a look and see where the security issues may be in your API which is super helpful. So even if you don't want to scan the API, you can kind of use this as like a security API linker. All right, let's go back to our scan. Let's see how we're doing here on progress. Again, because we did do a really large scan that covers the entire attack surface, it may take some time. Let's take a look and see if any entry points have been discovered. Okay, so far we have one entry point, um, no found issues yet. Um, but I do also have a completed scan of this that we will go through here in a moment um, where you can see all the, all the issues that we found. But first, let's talk about self-defense for your app. So what does this mean? I want to talk about some initial things you can do in the first place to make sure that your apps are secure from the get-go. All right. so. Let's see here. Let me see where am I? Okay, first things first. We're going to talk about input validation. We're going to talk about output encoding. And then last but not least, we're going to talk about authentication and authorization. So first things first, input validation. Where do attackers get into your app? Well, they get in via input, right? Where else would they go? Um, there's not like magical back doors as much as uh, 
as much as the movies want you to think that, the main places that attackers are gonna put stuff in your app and try to exploit your app is through all the inputs. So let me give you a story here. So a colleague of mine, Tanya Jenka, had an app that she was, uh, she was writing and something happened to it where there was a blind SQL injection that was able to get into the app and she didn't know about it. So how did she find out? Well, she didn't find out from using it to ask. She didn't find out from the cybersecurity team. She didn't find out because some tests ran and told her otherwise. The way she found out is Vice Magazine sent her an email and asked her, excuse me, Ms. Jenka, would you please give us a quote about how the data of your organization is on sale on the dark web for $50? Now, that's kind of a bummer. She got in trouble, but she got into more trouble by joking that the data was only worth $50. So, like I said, this is hopefully to illustrate to you that input validation is the most important thing. Things like blind SQL injections and being super embarrassed by Vice Magazine could be totally obliterated um, if, if people in, uh, validated their inputs properly. Anywhere from 80 to 90% of attacks would disappear. Now, again, I wanna say you have to validate your input properly. You can't just try to figure it out and not really understand what you're doing. You have to do it properly. But if you do it properly, you will save yourself so much headache and the security team will love you for it. Okay, so what do I mean by input validation? Um, if you recognize this picture, Gold Star, it's a great movie, it's from the 80s. So what does that mean? All right, input validation to your app can, uh, can include database queries, it can include URL parameters, body parameters, anything that goes into your app, you need to validate it. So um, what else you can do to uh, make sure that this is correct? Make sure you validate things on the server side. Do not validate them on the client side. Validate them on the trusted server side. Use an allow list, not a block list. Another way to say this is a white list or black list, but we say allow list and block list here. So why would you use an allow list and not a block list? Well, let me say it this way. Allow lists give you more control. Block lists do not give you as much control over what you are um, validating or not validating. So if you have some known uh, issues or known websites that you really don't want getting into your app or anything like that, sure, go ahead and put them on a block list. But so much better way to do this is to use an allow list. And always, always check first, is this input okay? Okay, so here's an example. The good part about input, val input validation is actually not all that hard to implement. Um, as you can see, the code on the right side with thumbs up and the partying face isn't that much more complex than the code on the left side with the you know down down thumbs and barfing face um, is is uh, the the code that is has the validation for the input is not so hard it's not too difficult and of course the code on the left has no input validation at all so I just want to show you that example to illustrate not only is it crucial but it's not too hard and you don't need to be a cybersecurity expert to be able to do it all right moving on let's talk about output encoding so what is output encoding Let's see here. So output encoding helps to guard against cross-site scripting and injection attacks. Um, and what it essentially does is it makes special characters such as ampersand and whatnot, uh, it makes them occur to the server as data, not code to be executed. So what does that mean? Let's go into that a little bit, a little bit deeper. The OWASP definition of output encoding is this. So encoding involves translating special characters into some different but equivalent form that is no longer dangerous in the target interpreter. For example, translating the less than symbol into an ampersand LT string when writing to an HTML page. Why is this important? Well, an attacker can run all kinds of wonky code on your server if for some reason they get past input validation. They can destroy the server. They can steal data. They can corrupt files, you name it. Um, if you have an example of this, actually, I'd like to know, put it in the chat. 
And uh, so what I do want to say too is anything that is reflected back onto the screen must have output encoding. Let me give you a little example of what output encoding would look like. Like I said earlier, the lesser than symbol turns into this, ampersand LT. So it encodes a symbol or a special character into something that is equivalent, but not dangerous. So that is a great thing to add into your code. All right, any questions, comments, concerns, anything of that nature? I'll wait a second. Okay, cool, let's go on. Last thing you can do um, to make sure that your web app is protected from the get-go is to properly implement authentication and authorization. So I will say this, my previous job to this was working for an authentication shop called FusionAuth. And this is one thing I really took away from that job is do not, do not, do not roll your own authentication. Well, why? You're a good coder, why can't you? Let me say it this way. Authentication is a beast. It is hugely, hugely difficult to write properly. Um, and what happens oftentimes is that we'll write our own authentication, but then because authentication doesn't really make money, features do, it falls into disrepair and it's very, very easy to exploit. Um, and sometimes also people will just store hashed and salted passwords in a database. That is not enough. You need way more layers than that. So let me give you a story about what happens when you write your own off and it gets breached. So there was an attack on a, on a web application where these attackers breached the web app and stole email and password combinations. So I'm not quite sure if the email password combinations were just maybe hashed incorrectly or they were able to brute force their way of decrypting them, but that would be bad enough. So now, okay, these attackers can log in to anyone on that web app. The problem is, is that most people, myself until only recently included, use the same email password combination everywhere on the web. So what these people did is they tried these email password combinations all over the web and stole $20 million overnight. So that's what happens when you have poor auth, essentially, is people are able to get access to these passwords and usernames and emails, and they can use them anywhere they want. So very, very important to not write your own auth, use a third party provider like Fusion Auth or Auth0, um, and save yourself a lot of headache. Okay, Prakash has a question. If this is parsed as data, is there a way to do SQL injection? Crash, that's a good question. From my understanding, no. Um, output encoding can really help guard against that. All right, now let's talk about the scanned results. So um, let's go back to our scan and see how it's doing. I'm gonna go ahead and lower my screen here so I can see. All right, how's everyone's scan doing? Have y'all discovered any entry points? Any questions on that? Go ahead and put that in the chat. So this scan, like I said, because it's a, it's a large scale scan, it's gonna run for a little bit longer. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna sign out and we're gonna sign in with my GitHub account and look at a scan that has already been finished. So as you can see here, same scan, same target. We scan the same web app using the same parameters. Um, and we have had eight high, 13 medium and 20 low issues. What does that mean? Well, it means this web app is really vulnerable, right? Um, what I do wanna say is that sometimes if our engine is not sure if something is a big deal or not, it will, um, rate it potentially higher or lower than it should be. So there is a little bit of literacy that I'm gonna teach you today that does come with some of this. For example, one of the attacks we're gonna look at should be rated high, but it's rated medium just because our engine wasn't quite sure about the context that was in. 
So like I said, you can use this very easily as a software developer. You don't have to be a uh, cybersecurity genius. You don't have to know a lot, but there is a good amount of literacy that you will actually learn as you use this tool and you'll be able to start to spot things that are more severe than other things as you go along. So let's go here down. We're going to go to, here my mouse is, there it is, to issues. So let's click right here on issues. Okay, bunches and bunches of issues. The first one I want to talk about is reflective cross-site scripting. We found it in a lot of places. Okay, cool thing you can do with this engine is you can select one place that you found an issue and you can click on this little box with an arrow. It'll open it in a new tab and it will give you a bunch of information about um, how to potentially fix the problem, where they found the problem, how it might've happened. Um, you can also see we have little bits of proof down here of, oh, here's what it looks like when this re uh, reflective cross-site scripting attack happened. You had a pop-up box that came up. Well, that shouldn't be there. So it'll also take a picture and give you some, some proof of it happening. So that being said, reflective cross-site scripting, let's talk a little bit about what that means. So anytime an attacker's JavaScript runs in your browser against you and your computer, we call that cross-site scripting. Let's talk about what attackers can do. So they can download a keylogger and they can watch everything that you type. They can turn on your webcam and sell the stuff they see and capture on that webcam to shady individuals on the internet. Um, they can turn on your mic and listen to you. They can install malware machine. Um, they can also do ransomware. At the end of the day, cross-site scripting has all of the power of JavaScript. Ew, JavaScript is very, very powerful. So what I'll say to that is that we're not in pop-up box territory anymore. We are in serious business, serious stuff. So how do you fix it? Hey, look at that, input validation. Input validation, again, if implemented properly, would completely block cross-site scripting. The second layer of protecting against cross-site scripting is output encoding, which we went over earlier. One other thing that I wanna mention that I'm a big fan of is content security policy headers. Um, this lists all the resources that are okay for your website to interact with, any kind of scripts from other sites. When you are sending your content security policy header, please do not set it to star. What I mean by star is this symbol right there. Do not set it to star because that essentially allows any resources or scripts from other sites to be interacted with, and that is not good. Um, if you have any examples of any of this, but especially cross-site scripting that you have run across, feel free to share that in the chat. Okay, let's go back to our scan results and let's go to the next issue. The next issue is quite popular. You've probably heard of it. It was in the OWASP top 10. Now because of web frameworks really coming a long way, it is now in the OWASP top 13 and it is called uh, CSER cross-site request forgery. Let's take a look here. We're gonna go down to issues. Like I said, because sometimes our engine is not quite clear on the context of something, it may rate the issue as lower than it needs to be. So in this particular scan, the cross-site request forgery is rated low, but I wanna leave you with that CSERF is actually a much bigger deal than that. So we're gonna go here. Again, we're gonna pop up this little box, take a look at the details. Again, this is the details of where we might've found it, uh, what it means, uh, remedy suggestions. So essentially what you can do to fix it, how it might've happened. Uh, for this one in particular, we don't have any pictures of it happening, but it's good enough for us to know that yes, it is an issue and it is happening. So cross out refresh forgery, why is it scary? So let me say it this way. Um, this attack, it depends on a user being 
logged into a vulnerable site and then clicking on a malicious link. Um, what happens is that the website tricks the user or at least tricks the user's web browser into sending a forged request to a server, a malicious server that has credentials along with it of an already authenticated application. So CSERF attacks are client-side attacks and they redirect users to malicious websites, steal sensitive information, or execute other actions within a user's session. Like I said, it's a big deal. It was on the top 10 OWASP list, but now it's number 13. Again, reason being frameworks are starting to fix CSERF. What can you do? That's pretty scary. So first thing you can do is uh, use your library's resources. Um, if your library has a built-in, or excuse me, use your framework's resources. If your framework has a built-in way to deal with it, absolutely use it. You can literally Google React Native and CSERF, or you can Google Ruby on Rails, CSERF, and it will help you understand how to use those frameworks or libraries to fix it. Um, some languages don't have the ability built in to deal with it, but there are other libraries that other people have built um, to sort of complement those languages. From what I remember, I think Java like doesn't have an inherent way to deal with it, but people have built libraries and things like that. So check your check your language, um, check what's available, and use the use the tools. Um, another thing you can do is you can pass an anti CSERP token. That's kind of the best way to deal with it. Um, if you don't have a tool or a framework that's dealing with it for you. The second best way is to use a CAPTCHA. Now this starts to get a little hairy because not a lot of users like having to fill CAPTCHAs out all the time. So if you have to, it's, it's, it's an okay way to deal with it. The last way, which is secure, but not very user-friendly at all, is having the users re-enter their password. A lot of users don't like having to do that. They might actually navigate away from your website. So it's up to you. So first again, use the libraries and frameworks available to you, pass an anti CSERF token, use a CAPTCHA, and then if you have no other choice, have your users re-enter their password. Okay, open bucket. Let's look at open bucket. This is my favorite one. Okay, let's go back and let's find open bucket in our issues. Okay, so does anybody know what an open bucket is? If you have an idea of what it is, please put it in the chat before I tell you. Pretty like self-explanatory from the name. So essentially what an open bucket is, is an S3 bucket, so an Amazon S3 bucket that has full read permissions to anybody on the internet. So that's scary. Why is that scary? Well, I don't want all my photos and API keys and all the resources I have on my S3 buckets to be available to everybody on the internet. Do you? I don't think so. So how do we fix that? First off, you can make uh, bucket templates for your organization. You can set the defaults uh, to be secure just from get-go. Um, and last but not least, of course, you can scan your app with Bright and we will find it for you. One thing I want to show you on the open bucket issue that I think is quite fun is, let me make sure this is the right, yep, this is the right one. Like I said earlier, um, there are sometimes social proof of things that we found. For example, in this open S3 bucket, we found a picture of a plane in a forest. And we also found a picture of a cow with its head stuck in a tree. And last but certainly not least, we found a picture of an elephant. So if we can find it, Anybody can find it. Anybody can use a DAST, school, DAST tool and scan your app. So very, very important to uh, make sure that you have secure defaults. Keep scanning with a, with a DAST like Bright um, and make sure that the templates for your organization are just set to secure um, just by default. Okay, so that concludes the section there on um, going over the various attacks that we have found. Like I said, the, if we were to go over every single attack, that would be at least a day long class, but I do appreciate your attention on um, looking at these three issues. But I have some sad news for you. You are not a hacker now, sorry. So one thing I wanna mention, web app scanners are software and they are not foolproof. No software is completely foolproof. 
um, like all point and click software, it can still miss things. But what I was hoping to teach you today, and what I hope very much that you take away from this, is to catch all the obvious security flaws and train you to search for security flaws um, on your own from the get-go. So other security activities within your software development lifecycle will, of course, um, make your app even more secure. Biggest thing is please do not use what you learn for evil. Like I said, you can point a DAS anywhere on the internet and try to scan it. Um, our tool won't let you for the most part if you are not authorized to do so. But now that you know that DAS tools exist, you can go find another one that will let you. Please do not use this to do evil in the world. And last but certainly not least, please actually fix the bugs that you find. Um, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is that. I want to leave you with some resources. Um, first off, me. Um, I do not know everything, but I know how to Google and I have a great network of people that can help me figure it out. So if you have questions after this presentation, um, or if you have uh, anything really, um, feel free to send me an email. You can find me at kira.brand at brightsec.com, or you can hit me up on Twitter. We have a fantastic cybersecurity community called We Hack Purple. We, they were actually recently just acquired by Bright Security. And um, you can go there. It's a giant community of people who work in security, lots of conversations going on. We have educational content. You can take classes for free. You can talk to other people in the industry for free. You can go to events for free. Everything's free. Um, it's fantastic. You can just go to wehackpurple.com and sign up. Uh, you'll see me around in there. The Bright blog and documentation is fantastic. There's so many good like little mini bite-sized blogs that you can read. So brightsec.com slash blog. Um, if you wanna learn more about secure coding, you can take the course from We Hack Purple because it's free now. So if you go to wehackpurple.com and just search for secure coding course, it has all the things we talked about today and more. It'll just help you start writing more secure code from the beginning. Last but not least, there's a fantastic book called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. My coworker wrote it, Tanya Jenka. Um, I've been reading it for quite some time. It is amazing. It goes super, super deep into application security and how to write secure code. Definitely recommend getting that. Okay, um, just wanna open the floor for questions really quickly. Um, see if anyone has any last minute concerns or any anything you want to talk about. I'll just leave that open for just a second. Um, looks like maybe not. Prakash says, thank you, Akira, for the great presentation. You're so welcome. Thank you for coming. So glad you're here. Good to see you again. Okay, and then here's just ways that you can reach me if you need to. And with that, I just want to say thank you for coming and for spending time learning about how to become a more secure developer. It means a lot to me that you're here. Um, means a lot to me that you are listening to my presentations. I'm still very much learning how to be a good presenter. So I just, I love teaching and I just really appreciate everybody just being here and also working with me through technical difficulties. So thank you again so much for being here. And I will stay for a couple more minutes and see if there's any last minute questions. And um, yeah, thanks for coming everyone. Appreciate it. Prakash says, thank you, Open Security Summit and Akira. Thank you, Prakash, for coming. It was so good to see you here. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Akira. That was great. And you are a great pre presenter, so well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's very thank kind you of you to say so. Really right. Thank you all for coming. Um, Okay, if you can send me over your slides, that'd be great because then we'll add those to the website as well and people can see those. Yeah, absolutely. This is the last um, session of the summit as well. So great one to end on. <laughs> no, set it off with a bang. Wonderful. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Katie, would you be willing to um, send me your email? Yes, I will. Not a problem.